have a cocktail together, right? Ladies and gentlemen, our program will now begin. Please welcome the CEO of Churchill Club, Karen Tucker. Thank you so very much. Hello. It's a pleasure to be here with you tonight. Um, really appreciate you coming out and joining our discussion called The Renaissance of Silicon, Part 2, Startups. The origin of, of this event was a trend prediction that Naveen Chada from Mayfield made on our stage last May. Uh, he said that the renaissance of silicon will create industry giants. This trend was quickly voted to the top by our audience. Uh, with the end of Moore's law, Naveen explained, new semiconductors are required for a cloud-native, data-dominated, AI-powered IoT world. The rise of these new players will put silicon back into Silicon Valley. Last July, we held part one of this discussion with the CEOs of Micron, Xilinx, uh, and Arm. And that discussion was led by Tammy Kiley of Goldman Sachs. And this one tonight, part two, will look at the entrepreneurial side of the story. And here to weigh in are Naveen Chada, John Hennessy, Rodrigo Leong, Pradeep Sindhu, and Diane Bryant. Welcome, all of you. And we'll hear much more about our speakers and from them quite shortly. But first, some thanks are in order. Uh, we definitely owe a big debt of gratitude to Naveen and Kamini and Kelsey from Mayfield, who enabled this program to begin with. Thank you. <laughs> big thanks also to DLA Piper for their support of the program. We appreciate that very, very much. I'm guessing that some of our new guests in the audience might Appreciate a few words about Churchill Club. Next year will be our 35th as an independent, nonprofit thought leadership forum here in the region. Our mission is to, strength, is to strengthen innovation, economic growth, and social good. Um, we try to, with the topic, uh, the theme-centric programs that we produce, we shoot for what's new, next, not widely known. We try to advance a conversation rather than repeating what's already widely out there. We always ask our speakers not to pitch or promote, of course, and we don't really have a problem with that here, which we appreciate very much. Uh, we convene about 24 programs every year, and our, we consider our audience to be quite exclusively the active and dynamic people who are pushing industry forward in various dimensions. Uh, in all kinds of different segments. Our very first speaker, by the way, back in 1985, was Bob Noyce of Intel. Oh. And the hashtag for tonight is Churchill Club, and there are a lot of other relevant Twitter codes in your programs. Um, it's time now to welcome a special someone to the stage who has been practicing in DLA Piper's technology and sourcing group for over 25 years, and that someone is Victoria Lee partner and global co-chair of the technology sector at DLA Piper, and she will introduce our panel. I would like to also point out that the full bios are in the printed program tonight. So let's welcome Vicki. I really only have a bit part here tonight. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Karen. It's always dismaying to me to have to put on my glasses here. Um, Welcome. Welcome to uh, what we hope is going to be a really interesting discussion. I'm very excited to be here with you tonight. Um, the Churchill Club's mission of bringing together driven professionals and leaders to discuss what's new, what's next, and what we don't know um, in a mutual quest for new opportunities and insights is something that we greatly appreciate at DLA Piper. Like the Churchill Club, DLA Piper has been hard at work, and we have deep roots here in Silicon Valley. By the way, I didn't know Silicon never left Silicon Valley. Um, since the 1960s, we're very proud to have assisted many of the world's leading technology companies in a full range of areas. Our entrepreneurial and collaborative culture fuels and supports growth and vision for startups and multinational corporations around the world. We know that new semiconductor technology is needed to fuel and enable the many exciting innovations in the AI, IoT, 5G, data-centric world that we're all living in. There are areas with incredible promise to fuel social innovation 
and economic growth. Tonight, we'll focus on the startup side of the semiconductor story and what lies ahead. We have a magnificent group of speakers to lend their perspectives, and it's truly my privilege and honor to introduce them. Naveen Chada, Managing Director of Mayfield. John Hennessy, President Emeritus, Stanford. Sri Ram Family Director and Stanford Knight Hennessy Scholar and the Chairman of Alphabet. Rodrigo, and I apologize in advance if I um, mispronounce any of the names. Rodrigo Liang, co-founder and CEO of Samba Nova Systems. Pradeep Sindhu, co-founder and CEO of Fungible and the founder of Juniper Networks. And finally, Diane Bryant, former senior executive at Intel and Google Cloud, and twice named among Fortune 50's most powerful women in business to both guide and hopefully also participate in the conversation. Again, it's my pleasure. Please welcome our panelists and our moderator. Everybody know where you're sitting? Ooh. These aren't very sturdy if they fall off. Are you trying to fall? They're not very sturdy. Oh, really? Maybe we can there are many, many stools. Many stools, okay. Okay, so um, we're gonna get started here. Thanks to all of you for coming. Hopefully uh, this will be lots and lots of fun for everyone. So the, the overarching premise of this discussion is that Moore's Law is dead. So you can, having been at Intel for 32 years, <laughs> I know Moore's Law quite well. So, um, but so seriously, so you can agree that Moore's Law is dead, um, and then you need to ask yourself if it's even relevant. Or you can say that Moore's Law is not dead, it's uh -huh. just a bit sluggish. So um, to go back to what Moore's Law actually is, because it gets quoted in so many bizarre ways as to what Moore's Law is. So Gordon Moore, and he's told me this uh, directly one-on-one, -on -one, so, um, and he's actually corrected it a few times when I get it wrong. So Moore's Law, as stated in 1965 by Gordon Moore, is that the number of transistors per square inch of integrated circuits doubles about every year. And uh, when he said to me, he also said very emphatically, it is not a law. There is absolutely nothing inevitable about it. And so that frustrates him that, that it was called a law. And then he says it was simply an economic observation that the transistors will continue to shrink to the extent that silicon becomes free. And as Andy Grove used to tell us, uh, calculations at some point will be free. So. Um, oh, I have to add, at Gordon, Moore, at, at Gordon Moore's 50th anniversary for Moore's Law, so four years ago, he was interviewed, and the question to him was, does it frustrate you that there's so much industry banter about Moore's Law being dead? And he looked at him in his little humble way, and he said, I'm surprised it lasts this long. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the questions now to the gang here are, either you believe it's dead, and then, as an industry, we need to figure out what the problem and the solution's gonna be, because we've got a big change here. Or you can declare that it's not dead, and then you have to ask yourself, is it even worth the investments that we're making in advancing silicon technology? You know, if silicon is free and all the value is above the stack, are we gonna get an ROI on it? So um, someone can lead, anyone can lead, and you gotta take a stand if you believe it's dead or you just believe it's sluggish, and then you gotta answer what we're gonna do about it. Who's going first? Well, uh, I think, as you said, Diane, it was an ambition, a goal, and I think to say Moore's, but there was no Moore's Law. It was, a, it was something to shoot for. It's definitely slowing down. To say it's dead is premature, but I think more importantly, the failure of Dennard scaling, and the reason the press doesn't talk about it is they don't understand it. It's more complicated. <laughs> now we're talking about energy and something and power, and it's more complicated. But the failure of Dennard scaling, which is much more acute, began earlier and has really reshaped how we think about process. Who, who out here who's been in the industry for a while would have guessed that microprocessors would slow their clock down or even turn off cores to prevent <laughs> burning up. If you told me that 30 years ago, wait, you're out of your mind, it's never gonna happen. But it has happened. And so that that's really represents a, 
a key problem, and meaning we have to focus much more on efficiency because we can't take for granted what Dennard scaling and Moore's law was delivering for 50 or 60 years. So, yep. Uh, I, mean? agree. So, uh, oh. <laughs> I agree with what John is saying, right? Like clearly, Moore's law is plateauing and slowing, but I'll take the second part of the question. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense mm -hmm. to continue on the silicon investments, right? Mm -hmm. So as we know, <coughs> right, like performance and power are really, really important. There's just tremendous growth in end users, mm -hmm. whether it's on mobile, whether it's on the internet, and we are space constrained, whether in data centers or on our right. devices. So both performance and power are extremely, extremely important. And as a result, either we keep going on the evolutionary path of essentially just faster CPUs and everything happens in software, or we take a step back and we look at, hey, if we look at this as a systems problem, what could we do differently? And my belief is the world is moving from convergence in semiconductors to specialization, where some of the stuff that benefits from Moore's law, like CPUs stay, mm -hmm. but there'll be other things from a systems perspective around it. We already know GPUs exist there, from NVIDIA, we know network processing units exist. Similarly, they'll be like AIML chipsets, they'll be what Pradeep will talk about. But are you DPU. saying they won't benefit from Moore's, or they don't need the benefits of Moore's law? They, Moore's law? they need that continuous progression of power and performance I think as well. They need both, right? So essentially say, instead of doubling uh, processing every 18 to 24 months, even if you go 20 to 30%. So you're okay with it just slowing. Sluggish is better than dead. Yeah. Okay, and Pradeep? <laughs> All right, so um, I agree with what's, what's been said so far, but there's a whole bunch of stuff to add. Yep. Um, first of all, uh, as it was observed, uh, that, you know, there is no law right. like Moore's law, but there is another law, which is the economic impetus for people to increase the amount of general purpose compute power in the world. If there is a law, that's the kind of law. And so there's enormous pressure to answer your question, should we continue in silicon investment? Absolutely, hell yes, to continue in it. Okay. Now, the question is how? Um, if the number of transistors is not doubling every year, it's actually slowed down quite significantly, and it's likely that probably five, maybe three nanometers are gonna be last CMOS technology. As far as I know, there's not any other magical technology, um, you know, Quantum. Quantum, yeah. People it's magical. About it. It's definitely magical. What year? Name a year for quantum computing. Come yeah, on, John. We'll come Name back. a year for but, quantum computing. But, but, uh, what, for what problem? <laughs> for so simulating a quantum up. system right now. For doing a, for, let's say, name the year for factor, uh, for doing factoring. Uh, Prime to break factoring RSA. works. Prime factoring of RSA. Yes. Anybody want to bet less than 20 years? No takers. See. Right, right. So, That's the way you phrase well, it. They'd feel silly if they raised their hands. No, no, no. <laughs> They're bold. They're bold. Okay, so finish. I'd say maybe, That's maybe 15 No, you're, years. On, you're right. on it, Pradeep. That's okay, good. So, so there's absolutely an impetus to keep improving performance. Now, if the performance will naturally improve because the number of transistors is increasing and the clock speed is increasing, you've got to find another way. Well, the only other way I can think of is to either increase the number of devices, which is happening anyway, mm -hmm. but there's one other thing you can do. You can actually look at important workloads and build engines that are specialized to handling those workloads. That's already happening. Right, and we're going, to talk, we're going to talk about specialized, yeah. but, but you're right. saying you get the performance for that specialized workload that you wouldn't mm -hmm. have gotten from a general purpose exactly. with right. and so, law. And so yeah. if there is a renaissance in silicon, it is the uh, re-emergence of specialized architectures for particular workloads. And as the you fungible know, guy, you believe that a lot, right? Well. <laughs> Abs I absolutely believe in that. We all do. <laughs> but we, yeah. I think Rodrigo, I hope do. you're in that game too. I, I think it's pretty obvious by now that that is already happening. Yeah. The alternative um, is grim. Yeah. The alternative is grim. Okay, the alternative so, is very grim. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, that was good. Oh, Rodrigo, do you wanna make a comment on Moore's Law? Dead or alive? Dead or alive? Alive-ish. Alive-ish. Uh, <laughs> it, oh, here's the, why I say that. No, here's why I say that. So I, th I, I do think that, you know, so last, we spent the last 15 years uh, designing spark processors and thinking about those and you know, building large chips. And here's what I think about transistors, right? Whether that's, you know, whether Morse law is working or not, we're trying to help by redefining what's a transistor. Right? So we're just calling something a transistor, you know, what used to be a particular structure. Uh, we 
We have the many things to call, well now this thing is also a transistor, and you can pack many transistors, right? It's and seven so, nanometers, no it's But five, here's, no, here's what I think we, we do need. I think there is a resurgence uh, of uh, semiconductor uh, uh, technology helping the world with a variety of things. But what we struggled with for years and years and years is, uh, isn't how many transistors are available to me. I think if you actually find a way to actually get, more, get me more metal, right? Connectivity we found is a, a way, We found a way to actually build a lot of uh, uh, um, dense, dense pockets of transistors uh, to do certain things, but I couldn't get to it. Yep, I couldn't I get data to it, I couldn't get it out of there. And yeah. so you, you have, you know, the variety of issues, you know, people talk about thermal on the chip level, we're talking about uh, thermal at a local level on the die, right? So now you're thinking, okay. yeah, you're, you're, you're thinking about the entire chip because this part is hot, but everywhere else is cold, right? So, so I mean, those are the types of things that say, you know, if you, if you can find a, a solution for metals, and uh, on die, on die connectivity. Yeah. yeah, I think that will open up. Yeah. A so advancement will continue, just so, not the transistor. Yeah. It's a very and there's point. one other yeah. thing that is really important to point and out. Then we're going to go to the second question. Yeah, <laughs> it's really important to point out that that if you look at uh, the in increase in the performance of a chip, yep. it increases linearly with the best it can do is increase linearly with the number of transistors. But if you look at the I/O bandwidth coming out of the chip, it actually goes to the oh, square yeah. root, and this means that if I build a chip too large. I'm going to have memory exhaust. Yep. That problem needs to be solved actually before anything else. And we don't have a good solution to that right yeah. now. That's a good point. Great points. Really good. OK, so we're going to switch gears here. Um, not switch gears, but just go to the next question, which is the consolidation of silicon manufacturing, so the foundries. There's been an incredible consolidation in the market. We know it's extremely, extremely expensive to build silicon products. And the mass sets alone are tens and tens of millions of dollars. Um, and so you got TSMC and Samsung left, really. Global Foundries is kind of out of the game. They're not investing anymore. They're going to milk the tail. Um, TSMC, as we all know, is in Taiwan. And so if you're in this room, you've got to be thinking about China and the threat to Taiwan, a la Hong Kong, and what will happen when China uh, makes its drive towards Taiwan. What will happen to TSMC, our, our leading foundry for silicon? Um, so. What is the way out of this pickle? <laughs> the US government needs industrial policy. What's that? The US government needs an industrial policy, and it doesn't have one. Have you talked to Trump lately? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, you tweeted him just now? Yeah, OK. No, I, I agree, right? We've got, a, we've got a, gov a government that's not making it any easier. But you got to admit, if you're not worried about China taking over Taiwan, I mean, I think five years from now, or actually, we should tell you, when is that going to happen? So quantum, quantum computing is 20 years out. When is China going to take over Taiwan? Boy. <laughs> huh? Let's what is it, Naveen? It, you know the answer. Naveen doesn't say it. Naveen knows the answer. Naveen knows yeah, the answer. Just say it. Just say it. He's right? like reluctant about. to say it. Just say it. OK, so but what, what are the we going to do? same time that I mean, North Korea is going to take over South Korea, so we lose all the <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. We're left, with, we're left with Samsung in Korea, which Samsung isn't, and a, uh, which isn't a lot more comforting. They're actually a lot closer, right? They don't have an ocean between North Korea and okay, South Korea. OK, so now we've decided we are absolutely screwed. How are we going to get out of this? Come on, you guys. <laughs> oh, maybe maybe I'll, I'll jump into, you know, into the fire here. Yeah, please, Rodrigo. Yeah. Um, well, I don't know how, you know, when, when that all is going to happen, but I do think that if you look at the value chain of actually building semiconductors, it's way beyond the foundry, right? You know, if you think about the foundry, you've got equipment, you've got tools. I mean, this, mm -hmm. that entire value chain is something that's existed for many, many years. And, and to build up technology stack individually for whether that's China or Korea or the U.S., I think that there's just a lot of work that has to happen over a long period of time. You know, so, so I don't know that we're going to see a scenario where suddenly, you know, things are closed off and, you know, there's no more business to do, right? Because you know, in any in any uh, 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 environment, you got all this all this technology that has to be built up for the value chain. Over time, I don't know. I think you're going to see people finding other ways to transition beyond that. So, what are you going to do if tomorrow TSMC and Samsung are off limits yeah. for Samba Nova? What, what, where are yeah. you going to fab? Where are you going to go? You can't go to Global Foundries unless you want it to <laughs> unless Intel. you really want it to be more like dead, dead, dead. <laughs> yeah, that's the yeah, problem. Yeah, that is a problem, but that, that so, is a problem. It's a big it's, problem. So I think Lipu, Lipu, you should build a, a new silicon foundry, or somebody's got to. Someone's got to step up. Someone's got to step up and build a U.S.-based foundry, or we get but TSMC to redomicile. Diane, well. it's not just a foundry problem. If you look at the proportion of electronics sold in the U.S. and worldwide that is manufactured in Taiwan, mm -hmm. 
I would bet it's a significant fraction, about 50%, way more. I'm not talking about board design, system design, et cetera. Oh, okay, okay, all electronics, not, not And so it's, it's a dual right. problem, it's not just yeah, yeah, it's yeah. probably yeah. right. Yeah. Okay, so you're not, nobody's gonna volunteer to solve this? Nitin, come on, what are you gonna I do? Think, <laughs> I, I can't do much on that, right? Because the amount of investment required, I think this is a national thing. I think it's at the level of the mm. US government, Indian government, and it's hard, right, like for people sitting in this room to go think about funding a foundry, right? Because it's not only about the capital, it is also about the IP that comes with it, right? Like, I think it's a great opportunity for Samsung, for example, to s step up, right? Like basically if yeah. TSMC They're a viable away, competitor, absolutely a viable competitor. But I think TSMC has done a bang up job in absolutely. building a network of IP. They have done a great job of working with Cadence, with Avago, they have done a great job of working with certies and IPs where when I go to them, I don't just use them for manufacturing, right? I get a whole set of things. Mm -hmm. So I think this is either a national problem or uh, I think there are many people from Samsung in the room, they should be feeling good for the oh. free advertisements. None of <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I do think TSMC would be smart to redomicile into the, U into the US, just get out. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, do the hot least, can Broadcom uh, play, get out. There yeah. you go. No? Or it's hard to do, it's hard to do. Okay, so since you guys didn't solve that one, here's another one. Uh, <laughs> We tried to, but I we didn't know, make you happy. I know, well. I thought I Intel know. was gonna fix it, C Diane. Plus, <laughs> plus. Hey, if I was there, then we'd be talking about that. So, okay. Um, so, so now that we're kind of on the path of China, so you got, what, everybody, you gotta think about China in the context of yep. how it can impact US-based tech companies' total business, right? China's been talking forever about the five-year plan that they're gonna become uh, technology independent and they're gonna be net exporters of technology. So again, how many years until that happens? We'll do that quiz again, but it, it, it's inevitable. So what happens to uh, US tech companies when, I mean, what are you worried about, you know, uh, Pradeep Fungible and uh, Sam Manova well, I, and I mean, you've got businesses in China. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, what I see. Yeah. Um, companies in China are actually very hungry to learn and they are much more accepting of new technology compared to leading companies. Uh, which I think are making money hand over fist and actually can afford to be somewhat inefficient. Um, and they will want to develop almost everything internally. So, so this is going to allow China to catch up, mm -hmm. I yep. think. And then, what it, and then how does it impact and, 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 a company And what like do you think happens to your technology to you, yeah. when you ship it over there to? Uh, uh, to the extent that we can protect it, we will. But you probably can't. In silicon, you can. Uh, it's, it's easier. It's just wait till you sign that deal and you have to say, send the IP over as part of the deal. All those joint venture deals right. with the China right. government will it's, be really it's secure. It's a, it's a double-edged sword if there ever was a double-edged sword. Yeah. I understand that. I, yeah. I okay, think what it's are you going to do? I think it's a big, big problem, right? Like we have companies from the U.S. which sell into China. And then we have Chinese companies which sell into the U.S. Both sides are getting impacted. Mm -hmm. Correct. But mm -hmm. if yeah. I look at your question, right, like China is the biggest market when it comes to broadband users, when it comes to mobile. And usually innovation happens when you're close to a market. Mm -hmm. And the U.S. companies and Samsung's mm -hmm. and global companies have benefited in the last decade from the boom that has happened there. Yeah. And we are already seeing that Chinese companies, whether it's the telecom companies, whether it's the Huawei's of the Huawei. world, or whether it is, they're buying from local suppliers. Yeah. Yeah. So I think maybe it's time for you and me to invest in China too. Oh. <laughs> High five, we got something out of this panel. China Good. fund, okay. I can see it now. Are you worried about San Bonobo? You go to launch and all of a sudden the China market's like, no, we're not taking your silicon, we got our own. 20, you know, 25%, when I ran Intel's data center business, 25% of our my revenue by consumption was China. 25%, yeah. you don't just want 25% to go away. So are right. you worried? Yeah, well, it's uh, tricky for, I mean, we're in a space where I think there's a lot of attention right now as far as, um, you know, what, what we do to technology. So we pay, pay very close attention to how people smarter than us are trying to figure out how to draw the lines, right? It's, um, I mean, today we're, uh, we're not building a company that is trying to s feed one, one uh, 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 country or another, right? But, uh, but I think the reality of the world is this is an area where there is some, some uh, national security uh, concerns by, by, uh, by our government. And, uh, and as a company, yeah, we're, we're paying close attention to it. It's, it's not a simple, I don't, I don't think I can solve this on stage. You tonight. want Trump again. 
Second time we need Trump. So just, <laughs> just one other thing. I would take I would take a hard line on intellectual property because I don't think that the well, U.S. can compromise. Okay, we're going to have to move more quickly to new. We'll give but, John the next. Oops, yeah. We'll give John I, I, the next. You know what I you think? Look, question. China is the ultimate conundrum. It is. It's a large right. market that U.S. companies need access to together with what will become a major technical competitor. And we've never faced that. And this is not a redo of the semiconductor wars with Japan in yeah. the 80s. Yeah. This right. is a country that's got scale, got talent, got an entrepreneurial zeal. It's going to be a real run for the money, I suspect. Yeah. Right. A real battle. OK, now we've got to get to something that's happy, right? I mean, this is like such a downer so far. We're, OK, so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so one thing back to, I think, Pradeep, what you started talking about is we have all seen a, a massive number of startups emerge that are developing silicon products targeted at a given workload, so application-specific compute. Um, now, uh, it's Sam Bonova, obviously, Rodrigo's one, uh, Fungible Pradeep is another, you have Ampere, you have uh, GraphCore, you have Habana, um, uh, Cer uh, Cerebris, Cerebris. Cerebris, I mean, it, the list goes on, you, and then you have the proprietary solutions like Google uh, and their own TPU. So, um, the second part of that is they're building on some risk architecture, and we have all seen a zillion risk risk architectures in our time from Spark, as you were talking about, uh, PowerPC, PA risk, remember that? Uh, Itanium, the one that Rodrigo and I are trying to forget. Um, <laughs> Don't pull me into this. I am, I am. I am, you were there, I saw you. Uh, Ar the Arc, right, there was Arc, there's MIPS, um, obviously John, and then ARM, and now we have risk five. So when I look at that, I see there's two risks. One of them is you're developing a product, a silicon product, targeted at a specific workload. So how do you think about your tank? and then that workload, if it's AI, it's evolving at a very rapid pace. So how do you then develop against a workload? you got a three-year silicon development time, and the, the, uh, the algorithm is moving before you can get silicon out the door. So that's risk number one. So Rodrigo and uh, Pradeep, if you can talk to that. And then risk number two, John, is um, we're also, you know, in these developments, you're dependent upon a risk architecture actually living and surviving and breathing. Um, I have to say, you are ex extremely successful with MIPS. This is the 35th year of MIPS uh, processing. <laughs> yeah, Congratulations. Yeah. Uh, so you have to tell us then, so what does make a risk processor live on and what uh, causes them to fail? But first start with uh, how okay, you think so about your TAM. Well, before thinking about our TAM, um, because the TAM is actually very large, it's a $120 billion uh, infrastructure market for data centers of all sizes, edge, uh, medium size, and very, very large scale ones. But in terms of addressing the risk, the way we've thought about it, it's pretty straightforward. Um, it's to think about the notion of programmability in a much broader way than writing instructions for an instruction set processor. That is one way of programming things, okay? It's not the only way. And um, the art of building microprocessors, uh, you know, the smartest people in the world have actually worked on that problem. I don't think we can push it much further than it has been pushed. But there are many other ways to make things programmable, and this is what we've done. So it's a blending of general purpose CPUs with accelerators and with other programmable uh, logic, not, not FPGAs, but things that are configurable. Um, this is where architecture, silicon architecture really comes into its fore. So for the particular problem we're solving, which is data-centric computing and building a true fabric, you can actually really take that idea to town. This is what we've done. This is how we uh, prevent uh, we know that applications are going to change. The requirements are going to change. So you have to make things programmable, but you have to take a broader view of programmability. Excellent. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, yeah, I agree with a lot of what Pradeep said. I think, you know, we're, we're a point, especially with AI, you know, I was, I was talking to somebody the other day where they said, hey, you know, I've been, we, we've been looking at this model that uh, Google just released from, from, from May, and somebody looked at me and said, well, why are you using such an old model? I mean, this is May of 2019, right? <laughs> and so if you think about you know, how fast this world is moving, yeah. Um, and we're designing chips that take two years to design, and uh, it's it's tough. And so I do think it's uh, it's uh, we haven't disclosed exactly you know kind of all the details of, of an RS, uh, ISA, but having spent 25 years building uh, high performance processors with an ISA, um, there's something really nice about that, right? Because uh, you you can create an ecosystem where you can write software, develop software, and trust that the next chip that comes out will run, 
right? And so the word today is, uh, I think the world's still settling into, for AI, at least for AI workloads, we're still settling into what that's going to look like. Um, I think the different ideas of what you can do. And here's, here's the issue that I see, though. Many, many solutions have decided that some application that exists today should effectively be the virtual ISA. So I'm going to create an ASIC that runs ResNet 50 really fast. Well, no one cares about that. Very right? limiting. So, so what we struggle with at Sumbanova is really trying to figure out, well, how do I create a platform that allows you to write the stuff that you haven't written yet, to invent the things that you haven't invented yet? Because if you do that, that's going to open up a lot more opportunities than just taking something small and then running it really fast. And so that's a challenge for the space, right? It's, uh, I, I do think 10 years from down the line, things will settle, right? And you can do a, a lot more of that. But today, I think it's, it's just changing too fast. And so I have to think of a different paradigm so that people can write and code without worrying about uh, uh, the hardware yeah, being uh, rendered uh, useless. Okay. How did MIPS survive 35 years? What was the magic? What is the magic? Keeping thin, keeping the architecture simple and small and compact. And I think that makes sense for the core processor. But in this world where we have heterogeneous computing and accelerators, the accelerator can't do that. It can't take advantage. So the, the core processor can be a nice little risk processor. That's easy, no problem. Uh, and it probably doesn't matter that much which one you pick. They're, they're close enough. Um, the problem is the accelerator and how to do that accelerator. And it, it's an interesting time because I think in some ways the industry is shifting in direction. If you think about what happened in the computer industry, we used to be vertically organized. IBM did everything from the high-level software down to the silicon, right? Then we went horizontal, Microsoft, Intel, you know, and the, all, the, all the providers were above that. Given the software determines the world now, it's software that drives everything. It's a re-verticalization here that's coming, right. and that's changing how you think about computing and how these pieces fit together. And I think it's going to—it's a—it's a renaissance, uh, as Naveen said. It's a rethinking of how we think about architecture and silicon and its role in the world. Yeah. So, Dan, there's one other aspect which is really important to point out, which is that I don't think anybody on the panel will disagree that we are in a world of scale out. Mm -hmm. And in a world of scale out, in a data center, one problem which is stable, which is not solved properly, is how do you build the backplane of the entire data center? It's what I call the fabric problem. That problem can be solved with very, very specific silicon. It does not need programmability. And that's a first-class unsolved problem today that we're working on. Yeah, there's some fundamental infrastructure oh. bottlenecks that can be solved without, exactly. without worry of, of exactly. rapid change. Mm -hmm. Okay, so next, <clears throat> Naveen. Uh, so the, it, we're going to talk about the investments in silicon, VC investments in silicon. So VC investments in silicon startups or semiconductor startups was at its peak at $10 billion, total VC investment, in the late 90s. It then dropped to $2 billion in the late 2000s. And now over the last decade has slowly, decade, slowly eked up to $3 billion. And I think we have uh, Lip Bhutan for saving that bottom at $2 billion. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's the man that has always been committed to silicon despite all the fashion changes. Um, so, um, and you, like, like was, uh, John was saying, you, s you spoke in your recent blog on the Renaissance of Silicon, and you said, um, I commend the entrepreneurs who are putting the silicon back in Silicon Valley. And silicon did leave Silicon Valley. There is no silicon manufacturing in Silicon Valley, and so that is Not actually much. a true statement. Um, so, Naveen, um, then how do you look forward, so 10 billion to 2 billion to 3, when you look forward, we can't have all these, the renaissance of silicon without somebody putting up the money to drive that investment. So what's going to happen to the VC world around semis? I think it's only going to go up. And the main reason is there is this myth that silicon and semi com companies are capital inefficient. Mm -hmm. They actually aren't. To build a software company to an IPO is taking 200 to $300 million, right? Mm -hmm. You can build a product with five, seven million dollars. <laughs> After two, two and a half years, you go out with one million in revenue, then you triple to three, then you go to 10, then you go to 30, then you go to 90. Eventually, Is Rodrigo's plan? Yeah. No, he's not, not a software. Plan? <laughs> no. He's not a software company. Oh, on software the software company. side, I see. Right? Yeah, Similarly, yeah, yeah. if you look yeah, yeah, at a yeah. consumer company, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, you go like 
hey, what did it take for Uber, Lyft, Facebook to go public? You can't even remember. It's more than $3 billion. The total funding that yep. goes in yep. here. Yeah. So when you're at the rock bottom, <laughs> there's only one place to go up, <laughs> which is up. up is and then there. if you look at the fundamental problems that need to get solved, as the panelists have said, software is not enough. A general purpose CPU is not enough. Mm. So if you look at the world, which we talked about, whether you look at low power, 50 billion devices in IoT, right. whether you look at the next generation of cloud and hyperscale companies, it is inevitable that not only will VCs fund startups, but every big company which runs a cloud is building proprietary silicon. Right. They have to. AWS because the Google. juice yep. is out, right? right? Like software right. people say will eat the world. It's already and they have the expertise. Okay, so then they have the expertise. So then here's right? the question: they We're back to number of years. We're back to number of years. Yep. How many years until it gets back to ten billion? Uh, <laughs> I think probably three to five. Ooh, wow. Rodrigo, wow. get into that to, game. I need to talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think in the main reason. Next is, round. Right? Wow, <laughs> write that down. Oh. That, yeah. 130 billion is being invested, right? Like in the venture industry. And we're all happy. You don't have yeah. to defend it. Just do it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, can I? Yeah, so you, no. got, you got the check. Just write it. Okay. Right? Uh, uh, can I add just one comment on this? Because yeah. I, I actually agree with what you're saying as far as kind of uh, uh, hardware investments actually being a good investment. And um, I'll say two things there. One is uh, we are doing uh, chips, but if I look at my payroll, uh, boy, you got a lot of software people there. So. Yeah, of course. Hard is not enough. I think yeah. you know Always it's uh, yeah. You need a lot of software. Bias, yeah, I think that's one, right? And then Always true. yeah. And I think the second piece, and I know there are people in here that may uh, maybe thinking about uh, um, uh, getting investors and doing their own thing on uh, for semiconductors. Boy, find the right investor. You know, when when we started, you know, we, you know, uh, we want to steady hands, right? Semiconductor startups are tough, right? There's good days, there are bad days, you know, Lipu was the first one I called. Every chip is late. Every chip Every is chip. late. <laughs> chip is and late. it doesn't work when it gets there. Yeah. <laughs> you need investors with patience. Yeah, you, you do. Hands, you do. Right? Because if you get through, you know, some of the, if you get through the clouds, it's a very, very good business and it's very, yeah, very steady and very defensible, right? Uh -huh. and so, so you just got to find the right investors and, and uh, I think that's an important part of starting a company in this case. Yeah, yeah. people that understand the value. Yep. Yeah. Nice job, Naveen. Good. Okay, so, um, so on the investing side of the house, there's been a lot of studies on uh, US-based technology startups and the success rate. And the general finding is 60% of tech startups will fail within three years. They'll collapse. They won't get through Series A funding. Now, coincidentally, restaurants also have a 60% <laughs> fail, failure rate of three okay, years. Okay, good. So Don't if you're start a restaurant. Looking for options in investing, you know, just toss that one out. So, um, not just that fact, but also the fact is only 17% of tech startups make it through all the way out to exit 17%, whether that exit is acquisition or IPO. And the ratio between acquisition and IPO is 16 to 1. So the first question to Pradeep with Juniper and John with MIPS is how in the world did you get so lucky to be in the 1% with a company that IPO'd? <laughs> and became, so what is the magic? What's the magic of Juniper um, and MIPS? I can tell you about Juniper that um, this is all hindsight, okay? That the timing of Juniper was exquisite uh, and I didn't realize it at that time. Had we been six months earlier, the technology was not there to do a full IP stack in silicon. Had we been six months later, there were six startups already. Okay? Wow. Doing uh, core mm. routers. The timing is um, everything. The timing was everything. Um, I, I felt that it was urgent, but I didn't know that it was that uh, precise. Um, so I guess I was just uh, lucky to think about the idea at that time. And even more lucky to find uh, people who walked on water to, yeah. to help me actually do it. All about talent. Yeah. Yep. Well, congratulations, huge. Yeah, I, I think it is about talent. I think timing is exactly right. I think you've got to get the timing right and take advantage of the circumstances. I think the other thing is the truth is there were a lot fewer companies. There was less <laughs> venture money. Mm -hmm. There's now five or six companies focused on exactly the same space. Yes. Yep. So inherently, Harder. The majority of them are going to fail, just by definition, right? And occasionally a market is so big, you think about Uber and Lyft. I mean, we've got two companies, two successful, potentially successful companies <laughs> coming out of that. I think they can be successful long term. They've certainly been transformative. 
but two companies in the same market space. But why? That's a gigantic market when you think about yep. it. So there are not that many markets that are quite as big as transportation. Yeah. I think, I think so we I, live in worlds of possibilities, not probabilities, when you are starting a little company, right? If you're starting to calculate my success rate, you're probably already on the wrong, wrong track, right? So yeah. I always tell people, just give me a chance. I don't care what the yeah, number yeah, sure, is, sure, just give me a chance, right? And I think uh, that's uh, uh, at least that blif blissful ignorance. So what do you, <laughs> when, when you, so give you a chance, but when you think about exit strategies, do you, have a, you want to go IPO or is acquisition fine? Don't we all want to be the fine? next Google? Don't we all want to okay, be so the next? Okay, so you want to IPO. Uh, <laughs> so, mark the so mark the record. I, so. I think, <laughs> I, I don't want to point out how much money you already have invested compared to what Google needed to get. <laughs> think, okay, Naveen. Yeah, I, I think my feeling is having had, uh, having worked with Pradeep and having heard the stories of Mayfield investing in MIPS, yeah. I think these gentlemen, right, like they wanted to just build great companies. Yes. And IPO was just a financing event. And that's what I've seen that's with the 100 plus IPOs we yeah. have had. That's just a point in your journey. It's really not an exit. It's actually more headaches that's and more trouble. Well said. Yeah. It's more trouble that's for people right. who want to run public companies. And that's yeah, what you were saying, Rodrigo. Exactly. Just exactly. give me a chance. More. I'm not focused on IPO. Yeah. Give me a Absolutely. chance to be successful. Yeah. That's Absolutely. very well said. Thank you. Um, OK, so um, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, ask a question about diversity and technology. So. Um, as you know, 23% of the tech population are women, 6% are black, and 5% are Hispanic and Latino. And you just agreed a minute ago that talent is the number one driver of a successful startup or, a success, or any successful company. Yet 60% of the US population, the talent is underutilized um, by the tech industry. And you can add up the numbers, 50% of the population are women, 15% of the population are black, 20% of, of the U.S. population are Hispanic and Latino. So that adds up to 60% underutilized talent. So um, I don't want to hear about your chief of diversity officer, um, all that jazz, but what do, you, what do you think are fundamentally the barriers? Like, why, why is this true? So I, I can give you one answer, which is that, first of all, I don't believe that talent, inherent talent belongs to one category or another category. <laughs> Skin color, sex, whatever. So if I, uh, right. However, uh, high tech relies on science and technology, particularly science. And scientific knowledge, particularly mathematics, is cumulative. If you don't, once you fall off the train, you're never going to get back on it. So early education in science is extraordinarily important. It also happens to be difficult. Okay. It was difficult for me. Um, for most people, it's difficult. Uh, for some people, mathematics comes very easily. For me, it came with a little bit of difficulty, but, but you have to persist. Most people don't want to work hard. So I don't know a good solution to that problem. You Wait a minute. Women, women don't want to work hard? That's what it sounds like hard? you're saying. Oh. <laughs> that, is, that is not what I said. Oh. Hey, I'm, I'm trying to help you here, Pradeep. <laughs> Why You're digging a deep hole, take you know? Two. Take two. So, take, take two. Take two. OK. <laughs> so my point is that this problem can only be addressed by focusing on early education and that's making true. sure oh, that people have good science education, that there are good programs in, uh, you know, starting from middle school onwards. That's the place to focus. Asking the question once somebody's already had their formation and they're 20, 25 years old, you, are, you cannot fix the problem then. It's too late. That that's, part, I agree. That part I agree. You got to keep the girls and the minorities in math and science in the primary education. That, that's I completely agree with that. That's we'll, we'll ignore all that other yep. stuff. Okay. <laughs> so I think I think it does come down to social issues in society, role models, getting women to feel comfortable, getting them to not feel isolated because they're taking and you know, electrical engineering is much worse than computer science, and it's lagged even more. So we need to we need to do that. Um, my my 14 month old granddaughter just got her newest book, oh. Rosie Revere, Engineer. Oh. You know, that's oh, nice. the message. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. I think uh, my feeling is, right, this problem will continue unless people in this room and executives and entrepreneurs make an extra effort. Mm -hmm. And each one of us, right, like has to make everybody aware that this problem exists. But what are we going to do to create that opportunity? And if we take baby steps, right, like in this direction, it'll make a difference. Mm -hmm. Just as an example, 
uh, Mayfield has partnered with Microsoft and Melinda Gates uh, to create a global female founders competition. It's only $5 million, but you know what? Thousands of women are applying to get that pre-seed funding. So I think if each of us now, that's a small percentage of what Mayfield invests, but you know what? It's a step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what people have to do if we believe in this. Mm -hmm. I think we have to do something about it. So, and each one, if we contribute 1%, 2% of our focus and say, let's make a difference, it'll happen. Yeah, it's not the you talk, know, it's the, the walk. The, the, yep. the underlying Rodrigo one other thing that, to, Can that, Rodrigo go and then you go? Sure. Of Red, Rodrigo, you were going to say something. No, I agree with all those things. I, our, my, my view was a little more tactical. Uh, you know, we no, we think about kind of, um, and some of this is my experience with Orko San, and some of it is uh, with Samanova, but what I noticed was, you know, in the pace of work, and we're trying to, we're trying to move quickly, mm -hmm. Uh, sometimes we fall into habits of uh, just kind of seeing who who do we connect with. Mm -hmm. And I think those uh, connections sometimes, mm -hmm. if we don't take the time to really yeah. uh, uh, look at it, it may be more, hey, who works like me, who thinks like me? That's what, what it is. And so one of the things that we try to be a lot more uh, careful about is just think about the result, right? What is, it that, what, is the, what is the question you're asking? Instead of connecting on the how, how did it go about it? What, what, was, what was the end result? And we found actually a material difference in the interview results when we were doing this at, uh, at Oracle Sun, uh, where we just took the time and say, look, you know, it's not about speed of interview. Can you actually bring people in a couple more times? Because if you actually get a breath, you may actually find that there are people that think differently that actually can get to some pretty creative answers if you give it a little more time. That's well said, thank you for that. And, and you have impressive results of your own executive team. Yeah, I mean, we're small. We're a small company right now. We're 36% of the executive team is uh, uh, female today. And uh, I mean, a lot of these are long-term relationships. I know we've got a couple of people here. I know Penny, Penny's here. But uh, I mean, these are relationships that you build over a long period of time. And Penny's been with, uh, you know, Penny and I have worked together for 20 years. And she's taped out every chip we've done for the last, what, you know, I don't know, 12 years. And so, so, I mean, you know, these are relationships you build over time. But I, I do think it's something that I think you have to you have to make a, an effort to cultivate those relationships. That was well said. So thank you for all of your answers. Oh, you were going to add I just yeah. want to add one other thing. That when you're trying to solve hard problems, uh, it's really important to have diversity of thought. Mm -hmm. And if you try to hire mm -hmm. people like yourself, mm -hmm. you're not going to get that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I just, I'll say you know, what I always say. We need you gentlemen, because you can't ask the marginalized population to yeah. solve the marginalization yeah. of the same population. Yeah. <laughs> yep, it right. doesn't work. You need yep. the majority population if there's going to be any change, and we need you guys. Okay. <clears throat> okay, I feel like I feel better. I got that off my chest. Okay, so, good. Um, <clears throat> so the, as a big wild one that you now we're going to really put you on the spot, you got to come up with something really insightful, John. <laughs> Ready? Okay, so what is the next AI, right? We had business intelligence, structured data. Then we had big data, Hadoop. Everyone ran out and got a Hadoop deployment. Then we had machine learning, traditional machine learning. Then deep learning and reasoning systems. Okay, so what's next? How does that evolution continue? Where do you I, see I think AI the going? The a AI is going to go to uh, AGI, to, to artificial general intelligence. I, I think it's going to be a hard process to get there, mm -hmm. but I think you're going to see machines which satisfy the most stringent version of the Turing test you could ever imagine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are probably more than 10, but probably less than 30 or 40 uh, years away. And the rate at which, so there's one thing that's going as fast as Moore's Law, and that's the rate of progress in machine learning. Amen. It is going as it's fast. Moving. The number of papers, the number of the number of people. PC investments. I mean, you you look at the undergraduates at Stanford. Not only is computer science the largest major, but the largest fraction of the students want to do ML stuff. They want to do AI, right? Yeah. So I think there's an injection of talent that is really phenomenal, and I think it will push the technology very fast. It's well said. Anyone else want to chime in on what's sure. next? Um, so I think I think it's uh, artificial general intelligence, but there'll be a particular form of it, which is federated learning, um, because the only way to scale is to actually learn at many places and then combine the results of that learning effectively. And now when you have the set of weights, it's now the sort of boiled down, uh, digested learning that you've done, and you can distribute it like software everywhere. So concentrated learning and then uh, 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 distributed learning, but then inference everywhere. So that's the model I think we're headed towards. Yeah, I, I 
Yeah, I'd add to, to that. I mean, it's, uh, I always talk to the team about the fact that with AI, we talk about AI like it's one thing. AI is like the <laughs> internet, right? It's like, what, what's going to happen? Um, we do think that we're in the very, very early stages of AI. If I think about the world, it's uh, about connecting people, places, and things, right? And you think about kind of what everyone's doing. It's very statistical in nature. I mean, today we, we take very precise Intel processors, right, that can do n number of significant digits, and we calculate everything down to that. But the reality is there's a lot that you can actually do with a, a, a statistical-based calculation that's actually very useful. And so, so if you take the world that's just full of data, most of which no one cares about, right? Mm -hmm. Most of the data no one cares And you actually mm -hmm. try to extract what's useful data. Mm -hmm. And then you try to connect people, places, and things. That's a hard, it's a hard yeah. problem. It's a very hard, just getting to the right data is a hard problem, yeah. right? Let alone connecting them. And so I mean, that's a problem that I think we're going to be trying to solve for the next 10, 15 years. It's not, it's not a trivial thing to, 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 to wrap our brains around. Fun, tough problem. Yeah. Any, any ads? I think the only thing I would add is I've seen so many of these investments, but yet finding something which is going to bring intelligence at the edge, mm -hmm. these 50 billion devices mm -hmm. which are connected mm -hmm. to the internet. Mm -hmm. I think eventually all this stuff needs to move there, mm -hmm. and it needs to be simple. Yeah. It needs to be easy because there's bandwidth is a huge issue. You're not going to move data yeah. from yeah. these things That's all right. the way up, right? You need to solve the problem there. Yeah, yeah. distributed, distributed compute, compute at the edge. Yep, what Pradeep was talking about. Yeah, take yeah, a lot of bandwidth. The take learning. a lot of bandwidth. Yeah, this is like yeah. bringing yeah. inference yeah. and yeah. processing no, at the edge. Analytics no. at the edge. No. Okay, so that was my last question. So someone now has got to stand up and ask a question. And we do have a runner on a, uh oh. It's going to take longer for the runner to find the, the uh, person asking the question than it is to well, ask the question. Just what you say and I'll repeat it. State it and I'll repeat it. What's your question? Loud voice. Or come stand up on stage. Just come right. on. Up. Okay. <laughs> uh, it better be a good question. Yeah, it better be. <laughs> there you go. That's right. What's your, what's your question? Okay, so I'm a big believer of application specific computing, right? Mm -hmm. <coughs> and uh, this is the best, uh, the only way probably to solve the post uh, Moore's law mm -hmm. era problem. And we know that one critical thing is the accelerators. Now the question is, where does this accelerator go? If you look at the server, it's even be a short question. data center or edge, right? Okay. You have two uh, socket CPU and a bunch of SSDs, and then you have a network card. So where does this go? In the Google, it goes to the GPU, mm -hmm. TPU, or TPU, and then uh, Mellanox goes to the network card called Smartnic. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Pradeep? Yeah, You're probably putting something on the, between the network and the data storage. So my question is, where is the ideal location? What, one thing I observed is... Wait, that, uh, okay. 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 okay, that's the question. All right. okay. you're, not actually, you're not actually on the panel. Okay, yeah. there you go. <laughs> okay. The answer is it goes both. <laughs> you want me to repeat the it, question? It obviously Rory? goes both, right? It goes both. You're gonna, you're the answer gonna, is it depends. You're going to have something at the edge that does some inference, right? You're not going to try and do learning and training at the edge. Correct. You're going to do that back in the data yep. center. And you have the data center to back up, right? So you speak to the phone and it tries to do speech recognition and then concludes it needs some help from the cloud, maybe sometimes, rarely, but it may. That, that's what'll happen. Yep. Okay, anyone else wanna add to that? Everybody happy? Okay, next question. Gentlemen in front, you wanna come up on stage? <laughs> Here comes the mic. Here comes the mic. Here comes the mic. Uh, there you go. So, m my, my question is uh, on the comments you made about um, AI, um, and specifically, what do you guys think, if, first of all, do you think that there needs to be better programming interfaces for neural networks and for AI in general to be like adopted by, you know, industry, ver different industry verticals so that like normal people can, you know, like do AI in their own business environment? So that's the first. And a follow up to that, like how important do you think it is for you know, uh, something like a Microsoft Paint for AI, whereby the compute and the network are able to speak to each other uh, in a visual way so that, again, normal people are able to like actually use this. And I asked this because my company was sort of acquired by an asset manager, and right now the biggest challenge for us is actually finding AI talent, mm -hmm. other than me, which is like, like you can't just run an but, entire AI so, department. So that is one really, that's no, a good Normal question. people don't code normally, right? I mean, there's just writing code <laughs> already puts you in a small minority of people. Writing AI code puts you in an even smaller minority. 
We're expanding that group as fast as we can, and there are lots of attempts to educate more people about ML in particular, but it's going to take time. The application space is racing much faster than our ability to produce, uh, produce people. But, so. but his point is well, is well taken because you have global Fortune 500 companies, they all have IT organizations, they're all trying to deploy an AI solution for their corporation to help top line and bottom line, and they don't know how to do it and it's too complex. So what, what I mean, it is, yeah, real, I, it is a real problem. So no, I, yeah, I, I, I mean, well, there are a couple of levels already. This is why I, I think this is kind of early, state, uh, early, early days for yeah. AI. And I, I, I've told Lipu and other people this, I wouldn't have never done this company if uh, somebody like Google didn't come in at least with a framework. That's already, we're already ahead of the game with uh, TensorFlow. TensorFlow, well, yeah. right? I mean, I came from a world where we had to recompile programs for every single person, yeah. every, right? And that's yeah. a very, very difficult world. I mean, this is why Intel wins, right? Because you've already got, got the market share. Uh, but with TensorFlow, I think it's already, we're way ahead. You're betting on uh, TensorFlow as the, no, as the platform that'll start. win in the future. It's a start, right? Okay. I think if you really think about how many people can even code at that level, that's a minority, right? And so I think what you're seeing is both ends you know, going down and going up. You're starting to see people build infrastructure to allow the masses to do it because it is going to be very difficult for you to say, okay, well, we can all pay a million dollars for data scientists to come in and actually write you know, these. That's these where Accenture models. comes in and, and all I this stuff. I think taking an yeah. end-to-end perspective, right? This panel was on silicon hardware. I think there's a lot of innovation which is happening in the low code, no code movement, and there's a bunch of companies who haven't succeeded, but are trying to solve this problem that how all these ML algorithms, all these algorithms, they can be provided as a service. So that any yeah. normal person can start using this and frameworks yeah. like TensorFlow and other things help. So it's a great area, right? Think payments, I just call Stripe. Mm -hmm. I need voice, I just call Twilio. So eventually, all these models have to become as easy to consume, and all the complexity has to be hidden. So I think that's your next startup opportunity. Yeah. That's what will happen. And I, and I think it'll, it'll happen, especially if you uh, constrain the domain to be uh, yeah, yeah. domain-specific. Trying to solve this problem generally is yeah. much harder. Yep. And there is a lot of VC investment in startups Correct. in this space. Yep. Yeah. Yep. OK, next question. Oh, gentleman back. So given the shortage of experts and given a set of human specified goals, how many years do you think it's going to take for computers to start programming themselves? Well, computers are already kind of sort of programming themselves. Mm. I mean, if you, if you look at these, uh, uh, you know, GANs, they do exactly GANs that. Yeah. For in a very specific domain again, OK? Um, what, what does programming mean? That's the other question, right? I mean, we, you look at so many of the applications today, most of the work today is just in getting your data ready, right? And cleaning your labeling your data. There's a lot of work just getting the data sets correct if you want to train a model, right? If you're calling training the writing the program, right? You're, uh, but, but there's a lot of work just going into trying to, try, and trying to curate that data set so you're training for the right thing. And so I actually see the world moving there first, that you're going to see the traditional computer scientist that was decomposing the program and writing you know, little uh, procedures to do X, Y, and Z, mm -hmm. you're gonna first move over to a bunch of people that are experts in actually curating the data, make sure, making sure that you've got the right data so that the machine can train. How, you know, how long before a machine can just do that part of it? I don't know, right? But that, that's a hard problem. That's a hard problem. Yeah, but that, that's probably the key insight, I think. Um, look at the natural language translator that Google had before they switched to the ML-based translator. Mm -hmm. It was a half a million lines of code. Mm -hmm. The new version that's ML-based, that's all trained, all on data, is 5,000 lines of code. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, the 495,000 lines of code that disappeared <laughs> were written by computer. Because uh -huh. they were written by training a neural network how to do that. And maybe that's the right way to look at it. There'll still be a human piece but they'll be increasingly, it'll be written in some automated fashion that doesn't involve people right. writing lines of code. Very well, and then the labeling problem, you know, you can somehow uh, con convince people to do it just during their normal course of business. For example, translation. Yep, ImageNet. Mm -hmm. ImageNet, for example. ImageNet, yeah, exactly. Right. There's exactly. a cat, there's not a cat, yes, yeah. With the uh, advances in AI, right, like uh, full programmability hasn't happened 
But what is happening is like you do autocomplete on Google. When I do a search, mm -hmm. yeah. there are tools coming out where when developer is writing code, the next library suggestions start coming from the machine itself. Right, so we are moving into this autopilot, not fully autonomous world, and it will happen, right? Fully autonomous, I don't know when it happens for programming, but this autopilot thing and suggestions are like beginning to happen yeah. as yeah. people write code. I agree, good, good comments. Rory? Oh, oh, okay, so um, at the very beginning, actually, I heard uh, Denner scaling is ended about 10 years ago, and that's your fighting gravity. And, uh, and silicon CMOS scaling and cost, uh, that scaling is ended, you're fighting gravity. And then the answer is application specific, go up the stack, make yourself more efficient, but the inherent silicon you're building on yeah. is declining, yes, deteriorating. You're I'm, absolutely I'm right. exaggerating a little bit, but. No, 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 you're absolutely right. So where's the innovation at the silicon technology layer? So that's, what, that's what Rodrigo ooh. said, we gotta work on the, connect, the, the metal layers, right? So don't worry about the. Transistor links so much, fix the, well, fix the my local view of it. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's only a small part of the problem. I mean, I, I think you have to accept that there are some fundamental limits that you're hitting, right? I mean, it, it costs a lot more to communicate data across a chip than it costs to do a simple recomputation, right? So you've got to accept that there are some, th th there are some real hard limits. Yeah. And Really, the move to domain specific is really about, well, now efficiency matters a lot. It didn't matter before. Moore's Law is going to the moon, right? You didn't need to worry about tuning up efficiency but because isn't, the isn't next it, year you were going to get twice as many trends. But John, isn't it still on the same base silicon? No, 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 but that, that, I think that's a, a brilliant point <clears throat> because how do you compensate for the slowdown in Moore's Law? Yeah. You make sure that those transistors you're using are highly, more, are much yeah. more efficient in getting the workload that you need done. A absolutely. So that's why we get all these application-specific that, that, solutions. That's so exactly you're compensating right, Diane. For, that's exactly right. For Moore's Law. That was, that was good. We're back at the beginning now. Did you know Moore's Law is dead? Yeah, well, it's, <laughs> there's there, Noyce's law, right? Many, Noyce's law, the, the cost law? of the fab goes up as the square of the, of the decrease yeah. in line size. I mean, that's a driver too, okay, because have, it means the transistors get more expensive. Okay, so we still got time for questions, so yeah. there's a bunch of hands up. Oh, we're, it's hard to see you. Go ahead. Yeah, here you go. All right, um, so in the late 70s, early 80s, the processor war picked up and Intel became the ultimate winner with Motorola getting out, right? So similarly, how long is it going to take for the AI processor mm -hmm. war? That's, a, great oh, that's a good question. I don't think there's going to be one. Well, there is already one winner. It's called NVIDIA, but there's many competitors coming. I think that's a very starting. good point. You can't ignore starting. that there is a pretty pretty sound incumbent. Yeah. 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 And yeah. by the way, um, the, the one thing that NVIDIA did very early was to come up with CUDA, and that's. Yep. Yep. The bulk of why they're ahead. Yep. It's all about the ecosystem. Back to talking about yep. it. How does a risk architecture survive when you have a sufficient ecosystem yep. around it? Yep. You need the language. You need the language because I think in these generations of machines that are domain specific, they are not going to be binary compatible. It's not going to be the model we used to have, right? <laughs> exactly. that it's not the same. It can't be because otherwise you can't do enough innovation. So, Too hard. so you're going to have to think about a higher level of compatibility in terms of right. moving software exactly forward. Exactly right. I don't think we have figured out where the battle lines really are, right? I think, again, I think we're thinking AI is a very broad thing. I think over the next few years, I think there are going to be specific use cases where we can start delineating kind of what are the competitors within these spaces. And, uh, well, just watch the way the space works out between people going into after inference and edge markets mm -hmm. versus training markets. They that, are completely different spaces. That's already happened. It's already happening. But, you know, I do have an opinion on the GPU, and, and I think Rodrigo Sambanova has a big opportunity, because even if you talk about NVIDIA, it was a graphics uh -huh. processor that mm -hmm. then moved to a high-performance computing scientific compute that then opportunistically fell Very into the deep learning space. Right. Yeah, it is, it is good ideas. Not, it is not an application-specific compute engine for deep learning. And, and it is not optimal, which no, is it's what not. opens up the door for all these startups. Yeah. It's not bad. <laughs> it's expensive too. You should. It is have expensive. Have you bought one lately? Yeah. No, it is expensive. Well, you know, <laughs> uh, guess why Google decided they need to do their own no, silicon. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Wait, do we have Do we have a mic for someone? Yes. Hi. Hey, we need diversity in questions. <laughs> diversity <laughs> in <Mic> questions. <laughs> okay. Just saying. So. Uh, you know, we talked a lot about the move to uh, application-specific uh, semiconductors, and as 
startups uh, go and address that. These are not like the giants like Intel, Qualcomm, et cetera. So what you're gonna have is, in those startups, you're gonna have a duplication of your CAD teams, your tape out teams. You've got your uh, ability to go uh, do some negotiation with the two only foundries that are left. Uh, you're gonna fight for ML algo talent, as the gentleman there said. So how are we gonna get, you know, uh, ROI or, or basically more efficiency in those startups uh, when there is a lot more of these as opposed to a smaller? So I think the question <laughs> is... Yeah, I kind of got, got lost on yeah. that. The question, uh, is the question, how do you get... Uh, how you as a survive? small company, <laughs> yeah, how do you get economy, <laughs> compete you against the folks with economies of scale? Have, yeah, as Samadova, uh, and fungible, you won't have the scale as, let's say, a Marvel or a Qualcomm, et cetera, well, when it yeah. comes. Well, okay, I, I lived it, right? So, you know, when I was building a, a product for Sun, people actually returned my calls, right? And, you know, when you're someone over, <laughs> no one pays attention to you, right? You know, but, uh, no, but it's, it, it's a reality, right? It's a reality, but I think I'll say this. There is an entire ecosystem out there for semiconductor startups that actually can lean into, right? And there are vendors who are actually subscribing many startups and then negotiating on their behalf, right? Sure. So I, I think it is important for you to, to realize that you don't have to fight this with the, the folks, uh, the, the large folks, and, and there, are, uh, there are a lot of partners that you can use for that. And so, I mean, we've, uh, yeah, we've been able to take advantage of that. It's been great, you know? And so we, as you grow, yeah, you, ha you have to worry about the transition. How do I go from, you know, growing out of this ecosystem that is target for small startups to then start to negotiate this yourself where your you know, negotiation leverage is not as strong yet. But I think early on, it's, there, there are other ways you can do so it. So there, there is one thing that startups have going for them, uh, which is they have an idea. And if the idea is really good, mm -hmm. it'll catch on. If the idea is not good, it's gonna die. Um, and I'm a big believer that most innovation actually happens in startups. It's hard to do innovation at scale. It really is very difficult. So you don't believe in entrepreneurs. It's only extra it's entrepreneurs. Tough. Hmm, day. Okay. Um, we, to Pradeet's point, the next question has to come from a, someone that's a, in the minority population of tech. You have to be a woman, a Hispanic, an African American, <laughs> or a Native American, and then you can talk. Uh oh. Right here. Uh oh, oh Diane. <laughs> okay, come good. Come on. Yeah, it's yours. It's yours. Got the mic. You got the mic already. Oh, oh she's no. a runner. Oh. Oh. <laughs> you okay, can ask a question. Penny? Wait, where's Penny? Penny? Is Penny here? Oh, Penny has here? a question. Oh, she's right there. Penny's over here. You have a question? There okay. You go. Thank you. Um, you mentioned, a few of you mentioned a couple times briefly how um, bandwidth and I.O. from chips is a problem. Talk about that some more. What's the solution? And how will that change things, especially now in the context of Moore's law being over? Is the interconnect more important, less important? Yeah, well, the inter data I, I can, all in your I've code. been thinking about this problem for a long time. I can tell you a little bit about what, what I think about it. Um, if you look at semiconductors, one thing you will notice is that uh, growth is still applies to um, flash memory, okay? Mm -hmm. Ask yourself why, and the reason becomes very obvious because people can actually use the third dimension right. very well. Mm -hmm. Why can they do that? Because the power consumption per flash cell is very, very small. Okay? You can't do that in microprocessors and DRAMs. But if somebody could figure out how to stack those things, life would be really, really good. You'd open up that, that bottleneck. Well, you so can stack DRAMs, you just can't stack them on top of a processor. <laughs> but that's where you need to stack yeah, them. That's where you need yeah, to yeah, stack yeah, well, Proximity to reduce yeah. the connectivity. Yeah. I mean, look, 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 the, the boundary, the chip boundary has been there forever, right? It's been there forever, and it's always been a limitation in some sort. The challenge the architect faces is to figure out how to organize the chip and the architecture so you don't have to move as much data across that boundary. That's the way to think about the problem. But, but because of that, the direction is now to go to smaller dyes with high-speed uh -huh. packaging there you interconnects. Go. So yeah, yeah, part yeah, of yeah, how yeah, we're yeah, compensating for the slowdown of Moore's Law is by inventing, inventing new packaging solutions so that you can yeah. create very high-speed interconnects. So there's invention happening. It's just yeah. not a So, Diane, that's, that's a very interesting yeah. point that because as you reduce the dye size, uh, the, you run less into the square root of uh, area of yeah, problems. Yeah, yields go up, yep. 
Costs go down. Depends on what you do with the on-chip silicon. It all depends on what you do with the on-chip silicon. Because if you can get enough memory on the chip, you can break through and reorganize the way the, the data works. I'm taking the gauntlet, diversity okay. and testing. <laughs> all right, all right. Good. I'm glad. So, Wait, here's a mic coming to him. I think you can hear me. Yeah. Well, the, the uh, video won't pick video you up. You. Okay. So, uh, John, you, f you founded and ran MIPS in the 80s. Juniper was in the 90s. Naveen founded a company in the 90s, and he's been investing in many companies since. And Sambanova is 2010s. What's different about building a company through all these decades? That's a great question. That's oh, a great wow. question. So John, you have to answer it. It's a hell of a lot more well, complex. I, don't, I, think, I, I right? think a lot of things are the same. Um, I think a lot of things are the same. There's more competition. Ideas are, there's more money and hence, hence great ideas are funded multiple times, I think to a much larger extent than they were earlier. Um, I think many other things are the same. Look, look, this is still the technology capital of the world. This is where people come, and people who are willing to take risk and, and join an entrepreneurial team come. So um, I think we still have a lot of the advantages we had in, in, in earlier times. It's a lot more crowded. I mean, if we don't solve the problems of what it costs to live in the valley, we're going to kill ourselves. <laughs> it's not somebody else who's going to kill the valley. It's the valley not facing up to the, the challenge of living here and building transit and doing all those things. We're going to kill ourselves if we don't fix the problem. And shame on us if that happens. And there's one clear difference I see between starting Fungible and starting Juniper some 20 years before, which is that the number of rules and regulations that startups uh, face uh, yeah. is a lot more. Yeah. It's much yeah. harder. It's much and, harder and, to go public. Like what? And Say it to get specific. Not only public, but even before. Well, Sox. Sarbanes-Oxley makes it a lot but harder to go public. But so specifically uh, between Juniper and, uh, and give a specific example between Juniper and Fungible. Well, you know, um, specific examples. Just the number of things you have, number of I's you have to dot and T's you have to cross is just much, much larger. What was the Juniper's overhead? revenue when you went public? Juniper's revenue, 400 million. Yeah. So today, that's a marginal amount to take a company. But well, either that's you go public good. losing a lot of money, or you go public making. Well, except yeah. except good. we were. Four million. You'd go public at four million. Six million, hundred million, million for. Yeah. We were profitable. Four million. Yeah. So I, I don't remember the exact numbers. We were profitable. Yeah. So having that's really good. Having been a founder, right? Like in the mid '90s, and Pradeep, you could relate to this. And even in the '80s, I think. In the 80s and 90s, from what I understand, and I faced it first time when you're an engineer coming out of Stanford or any other university, the first thing a VC investor would say is, you have no business experience. Yeah, they and would say that. you get a co-founder. <laughs> yeah, they would say that. Yes. yes, that is a big change. Right? Like, basically, that is, people that is are giving, willing to Except give. a few companies invested in people that didn't know what the hell they were doing when it came to the business. Which <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> we were still doing, but I think people were always saying, like, hey, where so where's your, your where are your MBAs? Where are your yeah, MBAs? Yeah, 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 right? yeah, no. No. I think like if you're a tech entrepreneur, you're being given a chance. You're right. Yeah. That is that is that a is a big change. The, the rise of founder yeah. CEOs. That's yeah. different. Founder CEOs that don't have any experience. It's massive. Yeah. That's very yeah. different yeah. than very it was. Than Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, what hasn't changed is diversity, though. Okay. Slow, Diane. Slow, slow, slow. Sorry. She had a question. One more. We can take non-diverse uh, questions. We will. <laughs> you go ahead, sir. I know you've been waiting a while. Yeah, so uh, taking a different uh, side, now with the advent of 5G, how do you guys see that revolutionizing computing, especially at the edge? That's a good question. We haven't talked about 5G at all. Uh, there is a degree of hype in 5G to begin with. Just there was in 4G. When do you think real 5G will be in full production? Pick that Well, number. I think that it's going to require a lot of uh, spending somebody spending money because the density the density cost. of Billions. cell sites yep, is 10x so it is 10x uh, because yeah the infrastructure build out so that's the, that's the big issue is putting up all those towers it's, and, and, it's and, just the that. and the back and the back yeah. and so you look at the telcos they're not making the investment that they had once well, they, they would make to. they can't afford to so they will they will only make those investments in Areas that have very high population density. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where they get a return. Yeah. Where they can get return. Otherwise, and power is going to become a big issue. Absolutely. Yeah. Right? Because it's already an issue with your smartphones and the yeah, edge yeah, devices. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there will yeah. be need for innovation. Like what you talked about on the interconnects. Yeah. There's going to be need for solutions 
which are the equivalent of fans, right? Like, how yeah. do you cool these devices? Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. to the point you made earlier, yeah. microprocessors, right? They're yeah. throttled. They never run at full efficiency. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, by the way, speaking about industrial policy, I mean, the U.S. is complaining about Huawei, but we have no company in the U.S. doing 5G. Yeah. None. Right. There's, there's Ericsson and there's Nokia. They're not right. the US company. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Huawei would be a whole other panel. Yeah. Okay, it's a good question. Question for you. So uh, in the 1980s, Carver and Mead started talking about neuromorphic computing. Fast forward 30 years, we're still talking about neuromorphic computing, but we are seeing investment in the space. I'm curious, how close do you think we are to new architectures that are inspired by the brain? Well said. How inspired do you mean? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean a DNN is inspired by the brain, right? Yeah. If what you mean is, when are we going to move to analog computing models, yeah. that's a very tricky issue because the march of digital technologies continues to just stomp out attempts that periodically occur for analog. So I would be a and I don't know. I, I think it's hard to say. I have yet to see the compelling killer app that's going to move us in that direction. But so John, I, I'd be a little bit careful about that because, because in inference. I didn't say it couldn't happen. In inference, yeah, inference. In inference uh, there are approaches that you can use pieces of analog technology. But small bit inference, I mean, you need low precision, right? Low, inference, low precision. Four, four bits. Throw all the bits, throw all the bits away. The volume. And, right, yeah, low yeah. precision, low, low precision, compute, but high, high very volume. Very low power. OK, and high, high here's volume. an observation. All interesting applications over time have moved from analog space Absolutely. to the digital space and not gone back. <laughs> so here's, here's one you're predicting is going to go back somehow. Maybe, maybe, but show me. Show me. OK, last story. question. Better be a good one. Uh, OK, Nav right here. Oh, wait, she's going. Navrina's going. OK, we'll take two more then. Navrina, go and then. Awesome, thank you. So one of the things that while you were discussing the talent pipeline, I think wasn't discussed was reskilling. So one of the common trends I'm noticing in companies like Qualcomm, Intel, et cetera, of the world is people who've done really good, like let's say have 25 plus year experience of building wireless modem are now building AI chipsets. Mm. But I think there's an inherent gap yeah. in the understanding of what AI really means mm. and how it needs to be solved in these new you know, mm. silicon age. So would love to understand from you guys, like what has really worked well in reskilling, especially in silicon, especially because most of the talent that's going into colleges is excited about computer science, machine learning, but not excited about ECE and AI architectures. Mm. Mm. Good question. I guess uh, I'll, I'll take at least a crack at that. I mean, I'll start with the fact that, you know, as a company that's trying to hire a lot of AI folks, one of the things I noticed was everybody on LinkedIn is an, is an AI expert, right? So, so I would start with that. Do not, do not claim you're an expert if you aren't, right? I mean, it's, uh, uh, but what I'll say is in, in this space, there is a lot of need for the expertise that exists out there, right? Um, uh, I do think that uh, the underlying uh, the, the underlying premise of how we're actually going to do computing is changing because the workloads are changing. And so I think that's a, actually a nice uh, uh, level playing field for a lot of people, right? I mean, we've done a lot of work with traditional OSs and things like that, and suddenly you've got these models and you're not programming anymore, you're, you're curating data, and you know, so there's a, everyone's learning, right? But my advice is, you know, get, do something you're good at while you're doing that as well, right? Because in the landscape of what we're trying to do, we are applying existing skill set just into a different space, mm. right? Mm. Not to say, hey, you know, I'm a great mm. SRAM designer. Mm. I'm going to go and, be, and be, become a new, you know, a, a neural net developer, right? It's, uh, <laughs> you need both of those things. But, uh, but I, I would say that, you know, you, uh, you can apply a lot of those skills still in the same space. Great. And now the last question. Yep. In the beginning of your talk, and actually towards the end as well, you talked a little bit about how thermals are holding back mm. the process. Mm. And now we have some high performance processing that's necessary. And we're, we're holding the CPUs back in order to keep the heat down. So who's investing in solving the thermal problem so you can unlock the existing CPUs that can go a lot faster without having to do a lot of this other kind of work? I think VCs are like us. Yeah, yeah there are some. Yeah. Remember, remember, it's a two-sided problem. 
You have to get the power in yeah. and the, the heat power out. And, the heat out, and yeah. it, you have to solve both sides of it, right? And one is a metal related to metal layers and interconnected that level, and one's the DC yeah, but, but I think we're going to get liquid cooling back, at least in data yep. centers. Well, we already yep. are. We're already liquid, there. Liquid we're already there, right? TFP3 the is liquid today. cooled. I mean, we're, yeah, we're, we're going cool. to be there. And, and I think there. the packaging technology, not back to yeah. packaging, I don't know why I love packaging tonight, but packaging technology, same thing, running, running water through packaging technology to pull yep. out the heat. So that becomes yep. a we'll, real We'll key. make some progress. So um, I think we are done, and we're going to turn it back over to Karen, and we're all going to stay sitting here. Don't move, gentlemen. Just for a moment. All right. Good job, Diane. I want to thank our speakers for sharing their perspectives so candidly, and Diane for bringing that snap, crackle, and pop to the <laughs> evening for all of us. <laughs> thank you so much. As a small gesture of our appreciation, we would like to present with you, to you, the Churchill Club speaker T-shirt. Yeah. Please wear that in very good health. All right. You have been a wonderful audience. Thank you so much. Please access the YouTube oh, video of this and share it with others if you enjoyed the program. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Good night.